Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to you, our president, Keith Luck, uh, president of Vistles 2016 to 2017. Um, last year, you may recall that I also ha introduced uh, the president, uh, and that was Jim Kang, and uh, because there was a uh, paucity of, uh, of good photos, you know, I had to make up a lot of stuff about uh, Jim Kang, mostly non-flattering kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, for Keith, uh, he's been very forthcoming and uh, we've gotten some good information. So everything I say here is going to be true, <laughs> but maybe mostly true. Okay, so Keith was born into a middle class family. Um, his dad was a civil engineer, his mother was a teacher, and he had four sisters. And you'll see that this, uh, him being surrounded by female family members is a trend that's continued throughout his life. Um, he was very precocious. You can see him starting to lecture at this tender age. Um, he was very hardworking. This is actually a picture of him, not some other you know, Google photo that I cooked up the last time. Uh, he was a very uh, good student. And uh, his mother, who was also a teacher, started him uh, earlier in school than the other kids. And in fact, made him go to two different schools every day so that he could uh, improve his English as well as to get his regular schooling in. Um, he showed leadership. He joined uh, Scout. There he is. You'll see this face often in the future. Uh, then in uh, 1972 to 1977, he went to Hong Kong University Medical School. He claimed that he was a bookworm, but actually I think he was having great ambitions to, to greatness in all things at that time. And um, greatness in his personal life was achieved when he met uh, his future wife in medical school, Catherine Ahoy, and they got married in 1979. And um, he has two lovely daughters. As you see, he's surrounded by family members who are women. Um, they travel globally. Uh, Keith enjoys scuba diving, badminton, and golf. I, I love this picture of Keith because just look at that beautiful follow through on the golf swing. <laughs> great, fo you know, greatness right there. But his golf score, maybe not so great. <laughs> So he's achieved greatness in his professional life as well. Uh, he did his residency in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery in Hong Kong University, which is renowned for the Hong Kong procedure, um, a very innovative uh, procedure at the time was anterior surgery to treat uh, tuberculosis, um, pioneered by Dr. Hodson, who was the head of the department at the time. Then Keith was trained by Dr. Arthur Yao and uh, John Young, uh, and those of you who know him know that uh, Keith went on to succeed these gentlemen uh, to be the head of the department. In 1984, he did a spine fellowship with uh, Professor George Bentley, a six-month spine fellowship in uh, University of London, the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital. But, you know, Keith was uh, ever ambitious. You know, he goes to school, two different schools at the same time, and decided to do a, a hand fellowship to continue on his, his uh, dedication and hard work. And uh, he worked at the Princess Margaret Rose Orthopedic Hospital with uh, Doug Lamb. You can see him here at dinner with his mentor. Um, but not only did he learn spine and hand, he did a little bit of musical. So he practiced both uh, hand surgery, microvascular surgery, and, uh, and, and spinal surgery, uh, both, but he eventually decided to focus on, in on spinal surgery, and he visited many spine gurus and um, focused his attention on uh, pediatric deformity surgery. His research interests include the development of anterior spinal instrumentation, intraoperative spinal cord monitoring, pathogenetics of scoliosis and disc degeneration, the use of uh, shape memory alloys and scoliosis correction, MRI of the spinal cord um, for cervical myelopathy and other diseases, and uh, allograft disc transplantation. 
So as is my, um, my habit when I'm preparing for these kinds of presentations, I also Google the individual, and I, and I found this picture of uh, Keith, uh, the world's first vertebra transplant, Keith Luck. I got his CV, and I thought I'd get one you know, file like usual, but uh, I got a folder, actually. And I don't know if you can see this, but his CV is divided up into 12 different sections because it was just too big for one file. Um, so I'll summarize his CV. He has over 200 publications in peer-reviewed uh, journals. He has numerous competitive external grant funding in the millions of dollars and numerous awards that he's gotten. Uh, the highlight for me is that he won the Issels Prize for the lumbar spine research uh, in two, 2010, uh, and he's held numerous uh, leadership positions. So this is just a small sampling of his CV. You can see uh, this is uh, one page, and there's another page of his grants, you know, and uh, the last one, you know, the last several were very large grants, uh, one on MRI and one on the nutritional pathways assessment for allograft disc regeneration to the sum of uh, over a million Hong Kong dollars. So in, uh, he's held the uh, TAM Psychit Professor in Spinal Surgery from 2007 to the present. He's a chair professor from July to the present at the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology at the Hong Kong University and uh, the chief of the division uh, from 2000 to 2015. He's held many leadership uh, positions in, in uh, spinal societies and orthopedic societies. He was the president of the Hong Kong College of Orthopedic Surgery. You're gonna see a bunch of pictures of him with medals here, just a second. He was the president of CECOT, the Societe Internationale de Surgery Orthopedique et de Traumatology. Really bad French, sorry. Um, and now he is the president of ISSELS. I'd like everyone to give a warm hand for our president, Keith Luck. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I thank Tim for the very generous introduction. And you, as you can see, I'm a very boring person. I don't have much to talk about. I don't, I don't, like, I don't have the type of achievements in sports, in golfing like uh, Jim Kang does. So it's very hard for me to, uh, to find a title for my presentation. So what I've decided to do is to share some of the uh, a piece of research work that I have been conducting for the last 25 years uh, and how it relates to this society and how this society has helped me uh, throughout these 25 years. I suppose many of you would have, been, would have visited Hong Kong and in case you haven't, you must come. This is um, uh, the uh, campus of our university and um, Hong Kong is a very small dot on the, on the world map. You, can't, you can hardly find it on uh, Google, but if you know where China is, where tai, uh, Taiwan and uh, Japan is, you can figure out Hong Kong is that small dot up there. So, um, and then the, this is the Hong Kong island. This is the airport island, and you can take a express train from the airport into the city center in exactly 28 minutes. So it's very, very convenient. And, sorry, where, where is it? Okay. okay. And uh, as I said, this is our medical school and our teaching hospital on the top of the hill. We have a, we actually command a very nice view of the ocean, the, the South, uh, South, uh, sea, South China Sea uh, from our hospital. And as I said, I'm a, I'm a very boring person. I don't have much story to tell. So I look up the, the internet and I found that it's not so, such a bad thing to be boring because science proved that this boring quality is the best predictor of future success, future. Uh, so there's always the future. And this boring quality is what predicts the ability to delay gratification. So if you find it not so gratifying today, wait for tomorrow. You're just delaying your gratification. And the faster success comes, the faster it goes. Slow, consistent steps will always ensure you move forward. So don't be upset if, if your research did not go the way you wanted it. 
and, but it happens to research also. As uh, Tim mentioned, I actually started off trained as a, as a hand surgeon, a hand and microvascular surgeon. And this is my sort of record. Right? I replanted four fingers for the four digits for this person in 16 hours. And that's also the reason why I decided to quit microsurgery. <laughs> you know, 16 hours is very boring. And then in the middle of the night, you find that you're the only one looking down the microscope. All your assistants, your nurses are already, the, uh, the anesthesiologists have all gone to sleep. <laughs> so I thought, you know, maybe I should change. So I moved, uh, as gradually I switched over to doing spine surgery and, of course, with a special interest in basic research. Um, so what, what, is it, what are in common between these three things? I thought they're t all technically demanding, they're intellectually stimulating, um, I hope there are no joint replacement surgeons around. I always tease them and say joint replacement is just, just like carpentry. You go in whack, whack, whack and you put in the joint. That's it. And you don't need to think too much. But spine surgery is very different. There's so much that you have to consider and so much to think about. And what is more important is that you need very high EQ because they're not always successful. So replanting fingers like that, the most, the saddest thing is that after 16 hours the next day, you see the, the finger turn black, you know, so it's the last thing you want to see. So you have to accept that and sometimes uh, you, ca you can't help. And it's not always successful, so you need all this high EQ. And so therefore it takes me to this particular topic of intervertebral disc transplantation, which I has been very passionate on this subject for the last 25 years. And I'd like to take you through the joys and the pains I've encountered and how this society has helped me. And I don't need to tell this audience how important is DDD, degenerative disc disease, back pain, etc. And that's uh, the reason why we are all here. Um, and we all want to remove pain source, and we all want to preserve the spinal function. Um, there are many ways to do that, and obviously one of the ways is the biological methods to repair or to regenerate the intervertebral disc. Because all along in the past, we have been fused, the surgeons in particular have been fusing the spine left and right. When you see a bad disc, when the patient comes to you with back pain, uh, you fuse them. Be it to be the degeneration, a mild degeneration, or to a very severe degeneration, there's very much little that we can offer except medications and then to, okay, fuse the spine and see whether that will help. But we all know fusion is basically an admittance of defeat, and there are many problems with fusing the spine. Uh, and I mean, as early as uh, many, many years ago, we've all been told that you will get uh, st stresses in adjacent segments and therefore you get uh, adjacent segment diseases, uh, accelerated adjacent segment degeneration, and so on and so forth. So obviously then comes the, uh, the new non-fusion strategy of preserving motion, preserving the anatomy, and obviously you want the spine to be continued to be stable. Um, I think Scott Blumenthal here is going to tell me that this is the way to do it, artificial disc replacement, and he may not agree with what I'm going to tell you in the next 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but then if you look back into the history of artificial disc replacement, there's, it, there's so many designs on, on, uh, that has been described in the literature. Now when you see like a hundred different designs of this artificial disc replacement, it just tells you one thing, none of them are good enough. If they're so good, then you won't need a second design or a different design. Of course, you can say you're trying to improve it every day. So what we know, this arthroplasty is as good as spinal fusion, though it may not be superior to. So you meet most of the literatures, this is a very modest conclusion that most people would say. And what we do not know is that does arthroplasty re reduce its, uh, adjacent segment disease and actually leads to better uh, functional results or uh, reduced rate of adjacent segment surgery or revision surgery. So the other direction obviously is what we are here for, biological repairs. We talk about this regenerations or how to uh, put various uh, things into the disc and help, help it regenerate or repair. So we put in growth factors, uh, cytokines, scaffolds, uh, the different combinations into the nucleus mostly and hope that the disc will re re sort of regenerate and um, recover. But it, it seems that these uh, therapies, biological therapies, will only work in the early degenerations and these early degenerations are mostly um, often asymptomatic and they don't need treatment. So you will not start putting in cytokines and cells into, into a sort of a, 
a, a slightly blurred disc on your MRI, and the patient is completely asymptomatic. But when it they becomes so advanced, the degeneration becomes symptomatic, then most of these so-called bio biological therapies do not necessarily work very well. Now, why is that so? I think because when you put cells and growth factors, biomaterials, etc., into a good disc with good supply of water, electricity, gas, etc., and you ask these young guys, hey, come build up this house. Of course they can, because they have all the raw ingredients and nutrition to do that. But in a very advanced disc degeneration, you have a rundown house completely deserted for 20, 30 years, no water supply, no electricity, and you send in a bunch of young guys in there and say, rebuild this house but there's nothing for him to do to work with. So my thought is, you know, how does the cell growth factors bound material work if you inject these into the cell, into the discs? So we thought of another way of doing it. Instead of asking these guys to build a new house or from a run, totally run down house, why don't we give them a new scaffold first? Now the disc is not a single tissue organ, it's, it's a single tissue thing, it's, it's an organ. You've got different things like bone, cartilage, annulus, nucleus, cells, different cell types, etc. So it is an organ, right? And, um, so I was thinking, why can't we get them a whole new intervertebral disc, like a new scaffold? And then you wait for the scaffold to revascularize, and then that's the right time you, you re reconnect the electricity, reconnect the water supply, etc. Then you send in these young guys and ask them to do a miracle. So that came the idea of doing a, a total uh, disc replacement. And what we wanted to do subsequently was to uh, start a series of experiments st starting in 1990 uh, when the Dr. Ran was a fellow in Hong Kong. He's in the audience. So after, the, after he returned to China, we said, OK, let's start this venture of going through this uh, model of this transplantation. And we operated on monkeys, a bipedal animal model, which was only available in China in those days. So I could not do, have done it in Hong Kong without the help of Professor Ran. So we did a series of monkey studies on autografting, fresh allografting, fresh frozen allografting, eventually uh, taking it on to a, a very controlled uh, clinical trial. And then, when I was cooking up this idea, I hear that somebody presented something very, very similar in, in the ISO's meeting. That was uh, Dr. Henley's group, at Henley's group in 1993. So, wh the, what, they, what they did was they actually they switched two discs in the same dog model, in the, in the same dog. But we, we, we actually thought about this, but we couldn't do this because operate, we don't have blood transfusion for the monkeys. You know, they have rhesus uh, uh, cell types, uh, types that, that you have to match. So we could not do transfusions, and if you osteotomize the spine at one segment, is already bad enough. You osteotomize the same spine at two, two parts. It bleeds so much that the animal would die before you could do anything. Right, so, so we couldn't do that, but actually, compared with what they did, you can see from the picture here that Ed Henry's group actually put a wire, circular wire around that uh, disc. So it immobilizes the disc, and we know that immobilization for the disc is not a good thing to do. So we thought this model is actually not so good. But in any case, when we heard that this is 1993, we were planning our research, our experiments, uh, et cetera, and then we heard this, so, oh, shh. No, we better get going because somebody's doing it. We have a competitor out there, and although they haven't heard what we are doing, so but we have to move on. So what we, right away we moved on to with our study, and then we did this first stage autografting. We uh, mobilized the disc in the, in, the, in the monkey, and we repositioned the disc in the same slot. Just thumb it in. We did not use internal fixation. The uh, the, uh, the the uh, the animal was allowed free mobilization, jumping in the cage. And then what we found was that the, the, it was not a problem with the healing. So the end plate actually healed very quickly within two months. Uh, but then we could see on x-rays that the disc height gradually uh, diminished over a period of time. By, but it tended to stabilize after about two months. And we also looked at the, bio, the bio chemistry, et cetera. We're very similar to the control group. And also biomechanically, it's, it showed that it actually became hypermobile at the grafted segment. But after a few months, it gradually became normalized, uh, became uh, the trend is like a normal uh, mobile spine. 
So this part, we came back in 1994. Right away, we presented it. Uh, I presented it in the ISO's meeting in uh, Seattle in 1994, and subsequently had this part uh, published in, uh, in uh, clinical orthopedics. So we thought, OK, we are taking a lead now. I did not hear anything from Professor Henley's group. So we are taking a lead. We are, we are ahead of them. Uh, so it was exciting. And then, we, then this is the anticlimax. We move on to the second stage, and we encounter kind of disaster. In the second stage, we did this fresh, froze, uh, fresh disc allografting. We operate on two monkeys this time. We switched the, mon uh, the, the disc from one monkey to the other, but it was a disaster in that because even the two monkeys are the same size, same age, same weight, the spines are of different sizes. So when we switched the two discs, there's a major size mismatch, and all these graphs fell off, either subluxed or dislocated. But we learned it through a bitter lesson that appropriate size matching and press fit fixations are essential to ensure successful transplantation. So with that, we were not so depressed, although we may be for a few days. And then we picked ourselves up, and we went on to the third stage. Because if you want to do it at a larger scale, you have to have a, a, a series of uh, uh, discs on, on the shelf that you can pick. And so we, we uh, harvested discs from one animal, have them all measured, and then we freeze them, and then we wait for the next animal's the surgery, and then we pick the one that, that with the best size match, and we thumb in the graft. So obviously, this is an allograft, so you would be worried about um, immunogenicity, inflammatory reactions, etc. So we pay more attention to that in this, sec uh, in this third stage experiment. Uh, but we try to clean up the, um, the, the cell, the, the red cells inside the end plates and, and so on. And we take only a very thin slice of bone with the disc. So the amount of antigenicity we transfer is actually very minimal because the disc itself is not antigenic, right? So we've, we did not find an inflammatory reaction or rejection a major problem in the situation. It all settled within a few weeks. Now with that uh, information in the background, we, we started a the, the very restricted uh, trial in, in the human. Again, this was the, the, the work of uh, Professor Ran, who's, who's now also in the audience. And what we did was the, we harvested uh, uh, allografts from, uh, from uh, young victims of uh, road traffic trauma. And this is how we prepared the discs. The, the intervertebral discs were shaped to a sort of a biconvex shape. And we thin out the, the, the bony end plate. And we have it stored with, uh, with a DMSO uh, freezing down to minus 196 degrees and so on. So the surgery is like the your conventional uh, anterior discectomy uh, after a complete clearance of the herniated disc with the posterior longitudinal ligament also removed and the uh, allograft was thumb in after thawing. So what we found was that obviously the neurological improvement is good because of the compression. You cannot attribute it to the, to the graft. But then uh, the neck pain was minimal at uh, five to s uh, six years follow-up. And this is one the example of the first surgery. You can see this was the pre-op. And the, the first graph, we purposely made it a little smaller so that we don't run the risk of punching it too far backwards um, um, to, to injure the spinal cord. And then of three months, post-op one year, post-op three years, you can see the end plate is healed. The disc space is a little narrowed. And then this was the MRI. You can see the smaller graft. And then this was a, a year post-op. At six years post-op, this is the same patient. You can see the amount of movement available at this transplanted segment. Uh, you will look at the space between the distance between the spinous processes. You will appreciate the, uh, the actual movement there. And uh, the disc height is you know, not the best, but it's still there. Okay. So this result, this five-year result, was published in the, uh, in the Lancet um, in uh, 2007. Well, is that, is that good so far? Yes, it looks pretty good up at five years. And then we had another pleasant surprise. What happens is that when we saw one of these cases that we plant, uh, put in an allograft, you see the graph was placed in such a bad position, we just thought, do we need to go back in and reposition it? But we decided not to because the patient was relatively asymptomatic. At six months, at five years, it remodeled itself. So we thought this is something we did not expect. We didn't, didn't do a good job, but Mother Nature has looked after that for us. And this is the five-year post-op MRI of that same case. 
So this remodeling must have responded to the anatomy, the loading, and the adjacent segment conditions in the recipient spine, the facet joints, etc., according to some kind of biological laws. So we thought the effect of remodeling could have a, a protective effect or on the kinematics of that particular segment. So we went back to our patients and we looked at, this, at the center of rotation of the, of the segment after the transplantation. And we, found, and we found that the red dot is where the COR was two months after surgery. This, this is where the, where the normal COR should be. Okay. And then over the years, the COR gradually moved from the early post-op period towards the normal COR. Now what that suggests to us is that the, the, this is remodeling itself to suit the natural environment of that particular neck. So the, 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 the facet joints, the muscle power, the patient's activities, et cetera, all contributed to how that this would remodel itself. And to further verify this, we went back to an animal model. We, this time, we purposely put the disc in a bad position. We put, put it left, right, and front, back, put it in different wrong positions. And they all ended up, gradually, it remodeled itself, the disc remodeled itself. We know that if you use an artificial disc, I think Scott will correct me if I'm wrong, once you put in the artificial disc, the, the center of rotation is fixed because that is the internal property of that particular artificial implant. And once it's fixed, all the other surrounding tissues, joints, will have to adjust to that artificial disc because you would not change, that COR would not change. Of course, some, CO, uh, some uh, uh, designs would allow the uh, uh, translation of the COR. But in this case, we found that the COR changed with time after the aerograph transplantation and remodeling plays a part in restoring the natural kinematics, it may have a protective effect on the facet joints compared to the uh, artificial disc. So we, we, we thought, you know, is, is it better than the artificial disc in that sense? So how does it help the adjacent segment? So we went back into another animal model and then we, this time we look at how the, um, the adjacent segment would behave uh, uh, at a follow-up of 12 months. So basically what we found that there's good mobility and morphology in the adjacent segment after this allografting in the animal model after 12 months. This is in an animal model. So at that point, we have to stop tick and recapitulate where should we go. We see that this is workable um, and then we would like to know more information, but why is that the disc will degenerate, continue to degenerate? So we know that it's doable. It's got the ability of natural remodeling, and there's no evidence of adjacent segment degeneration in the animal model, not in the humans. Now, at that point, we thought, you know, is there something translatable, like what was discussed yesterday in the other symposium? So we tried to file a few th patents, etc. And then when we searched the, the patent, another group has filed the patent in 2007, right after we published our work in 2017, uh, 2007 in the Lancet. And this group hasn't done any research work whatsoever. They just filed the patent. I didn't know whether that's possible. You don't have to do any research work. You just file the patent. So when we asked our patent lawyers, they said, uh-oh, somebody filed it yesterday. No, you're, you're too late. So, something like that. And then we were also invited by a tissue processing company in the United States to go and show them how this is done, how this, this, the, all the information that we have, and hoping that they will take it on um, to have that marketed. But then after a couple of visits and uh, they said, okay, we're not going, going ahead. So I, I felt exactly what uh, was discussed yesterday uh, by, uh, by Roly. They said, well, yes, you have enough science and evidence, but you don't, you don't have a commercial prospect because you cannot sell human tissues and um, it's not going to make money. So basically you cannot compete with the artificial disc market and it's not worth investing, go away. So that's how, how it ended. But like what Roly said yesterday, now I don't have a financial conflict. I'm not looking for a lot of big money from a, from a patent, from something. I'm really relaxed now. I can do whatever I want. I can publish as soon as I find it, anything. I don't have to worry about all these things. So all that glitters is not gold. You know, these things doesn't go as like, like the way we all want it. So we go back to the laboratory and say, okay, what can I do more? You know, back to the drawing board, look at the unsolved problems, we'll take more, uh, do more animal researches. And how to re rescue the degeneration of the disc after transplantation? 
So why why did this uh, uh, degenerate or uh, or uh, uh, did not survive as lightly as we wanted after transplantation? Was it the nutrient supply, or was or did we not put in the growth factors of the cells in time? So what what happens after our this harvesting is that the disc is devoid of all the nutrients, at least transiently, until it re re recanalizes or reconnects to the recipient site and get the nutrition again. And this period of loss of nutrient supply in probably induced uh, this cell death and then initiated this, uh, this degeneration from then on. So we look at how the nutrition is being re-established and could it be re-established. So we went on to look at the end plates uh, in detail. We found that the end plates actually healed pretty well. The, the osteotomy site healed pretty well. But after about six months, the, the end plate starts to disintegrate. So the two main reasons we thought could be the cause of this, either it's the immunoreaction, it's, a, it's an allograft, or the other one is a, just a natural process of creeping substitution. No, the body, the recipient accepted this foreign body, but it's going to replace it with creeping substitution. So it takes a few months, and then the creeping substitution starts to come in and eat away your, your end plate. And not only that, that the uh, damage to the end plate starts to affect the revascularization around the disc. The blood vessels, we look at the micro blood vessels, and they were changed. The pattern was changed, the density of blood vessels changed, and everything changed. So we thought this probably would be the most important reason why our transplanted disc did not survive as nicely as we wanted. So where are we now? We are back to square one. And we will reaffirm what uh, Joe Urban taught us many years ago, that the end plate is actually the critical organ. And so we believe that future research of this regeneration should focus on the nutrient delivery pathway, the end plate regeneration, rather than the nucleus regeneration. If you cannot solve the problem of the nutrient delivery, there's no way, there's no point putting in cells and the cytokines into the nucleus purposes. That's what we thought. And you have to have a balance of how much and when to put in these, all these uh, young people into the, into the degenerated disc. Right? If you put, in, put them in too early, you're actually competing for nutrients. So if you put in too late, the disc is already dead. So that's the, uh, maybe a fine line, the way, when is the right time to do what. And you don't want to over-demand from the limited supply. From that experiments, all these experiments, you realize how important the end plate is, and I also try to coin a, an observation in a clinical setting. A discs like this, if you, if you see an MRI with all the black discs, don't call them degenerated discs, because some of these discs, to me, have never developed normally. So if you look at it, they are, that these discs were never bright on MRI. So when you see a black disc on an MRI, they could have been degenerated. This is what you coin this term, this this generation. They did not, they were never formed properly. So coming back to our patients, we went back to these patients 10 years later and we look at the, uh, the clinical results and that was presented in the ISO's uh, Amsterdam Spine Week in 2012. And this was the, one of the patients, 10 years follow-up, and these were the uh, deflection extension x-rays and also the MRI at that point. Now, jumped, we jump ahead another seven years. Now, this is 2017. The first surgery was done in year 2000. This is the same first patient I showed you earlier. This is now 17 years post-transplant. He's well, he's 17 years older, obviously. He's now in his 70s, age-wise. He walks with a stick, he's neurologically intact, and this is the transplant that is done 17 years ago. So I leave you to decide what this MRI means. Right. This is, he's still having um, a, a mobile segment, but this is degenerated all right, but he's asymptomatic, and this is a 17-year MRI follow-up. So after 25 years, I think I'm not any wiser. In fact, I have more questions than answers. I'm told I may be lost at this point. But we, at least I've enjoyed the joy and also the pain over these years. And where am I now? As I said, I don't have any financial conflicts anymore. I just take this topic as my hobby. Uh, I'm now half retiring, so I can continue with my research. It becomes my hobby. I stay inquisitive, raise more questions, I may be able to answer fewer, but I stay hopeful and trying to delay my gratification as far as possible. So hopefully something more will come, or some gratification will still to come. 
But I'd like to uh, acknowledge these few people here. It's very important because Dick, uh, Professor Dick Ron here is the one who helped me with all the clinical uh, the surgeries, and also my students, uh, Stephen Lam and uh, Y.C. Huang. I particularly, I'd like to um, acknowledge Jill, Jill Urban. Um, she might not have realized it, but she actually has given me so much inspiration over these years on this particular subject, and I learned so much from her. Every time I ask her a question, she will, she will answer my questions or answer my queries you know, without reserve. So i really like to thank you. I hope she's in the audience. I really appreciate her help. And uh, I, you, you will know that uh, you know, the first time I heard about this topic by Ed Henley was 1993 in Itzels, and this is how this society has helped me over the years. You know, all these people involved, I made many good friends, and uh, I, I could dig out, oh, the earliest photo I could dig out was 1994 in Seattle, and these are the ones that I've attended. In particular, when I took, saw, read this picture again taken in 2007, you can see uh, the secretaries were here, the past presidents were here. I didn't realize that this is going to happen this way in 2007. When I hosted the ISOS meeting in Hong Kong, you can see uh, Takahashi at the back. Uh, 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 Yoshi is at, uh, standing on, on, on the right side, on the left side, and then so on. Jim and Kasu. So that was a good picture taken in 2007 sometime. And this photo was taken in, uh, um, in uh, San Francisco 2015. And I don't know what Dr. Henney is thinking about. You know, he sort of did this in 1993. He, fortunately or unfortunately, he did not push in this direction so that I, ha I have an, an opportunity to pursue in this area. I don't know whether he agrees with what I'm finding or not. And, uh, but anyway, I think this is a very nice occasion that I could acknowledge all these people uh, over the years. Um, finally, uh, as Tim said, I'm surrounded by women. Um, well, I'm starting to change. <laughs> On the, the, uh, this is my elder daughter, Camille, my younger daughter, Jessica, my wife, Catherine, here, and this is our son in law. And, sorry, and he, uh, his son is my, uh, Jessica's boyfriend. So I'm getting a little bit more fee uh, males in, in, in the family, hopefully soon. I will not be surrounded by only women from now on. So finally, I'd like to thank you all for the honor of uh, giving me the opportunity as the president of this society. And I have gone through this society for many years and also with my research, with the help of everybody around. And I look forward to your advice and your suggestion on how we could take it forward. Um, now it's 27 years down the line. Of course, we have newer technologies, better technical uh, uh, methods of assessing the disc and so on. So some of these tests or experiments could have been repeated with the more modern uh, technologies. And uh, so please help me uh, on in, the, in the future years on this project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.